Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. And what are we talking about today, Tara? We have put the brakes on a little bit and we are going into Tower of Dawn, part one. So we're going to, as Sandra says, get a little bit more about KL and maybe make me feel a little bit less mad at him. A little more sympathetic or something? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Part one is called The God City. And so quick plug, this is going to be a spoiler filled video, kind of summarizing and going over parts that struck us of Tower of Dawn by Sarah J. Mass. We have previous videos that have already been released for The Assassin's Blade, Throne of Glass, Crown of Midnight, Air of Fire, Queen of Shadows, and Empire of Storms. And so now we are diving into the penultimate book, Tower of Dawn. So be sure to check out those videos if you missed that. Empire of Storms Part 2 left our friends in very dire straits. We had Aelin being hauled off by the bitch queen Maeve just sailing off into the sunset and vanishing. But we had all of Aelin's crew from the Assassin's Blade on, kind of she cashed in those life debts and everyone showed up. Except for one. Which one? Which, Irene. Like, if you're saying her oh, crew, oh, oh, oh. Irene isn't there. The healer that she helped in Assassin's Blade, which in this book, we get to see Irene again. So, yay. Um, and I'm really glad that Sandra went through all of those titles because I would have forgotten at least two of them. Like, uh, there was another book. I don't know. It's been a long journey. We, we've been blasting through them. So it's all a blur at this point. But yes, Irene Towers. We get to see her again. And it's probably one of my favorite ways is how Tara put it previously because you remember in The Assassin's Blade... Aelin, or Selena Sardothian at the time, was training Irene to, you know, defend herself. And as Tara put it, it was very Gracie Lou Freebush style. <laughs> and so we get to see how her training has panned out and what she's grown into the past couple of years. So for that reason alone, I think Tower of Dawn is worth it because Irene was such a lovable character. In that series, she just had so much hope and wanted to do good in the world. And you have to, you know, hats off to characters like that. And then Kale has not been the most likable character. He is deeply flawed. I know Tara <laughs> can, can tend to be more tough love about him, but he does have some growth and a little bit of redemption and stuff that goes on. I, I did get a lot of growth in this book. I'm still kind of neutral on him right now. Like... His growth isn't as much as I wanted yet, but he does, he does do a lot of soul searching and recognizing where he made mistakes. And that's the first part to any redemption arc is recognizing that, Hey, I made a mistake and moving forward. So. Yeah. True that. So empire of storms, Kaol was dispatched with Nezrin to go to the Southern continent to try and, plead with the king to get their aid in the coming war because it's going to be an all-hands-on-deck kind of ordeal with Erewhon at the helm on the opposing side. And so he is going to try and A, get their support in the war, and B, go to the Torre Chesme for healing. So Kael and Nezrin arrive in Antica, and they get an audience with the equivalent Coggin. of a king, Coggin. And it's very almost Game of Thrones, how the legacy process takes place there. Siblings kill siblings. It's very cutthroat. And so this Coggin actually killed like his brother or something, right? To get the throne during his prime. And he has six children. And so Nezrin and Kale come to the throne room to get an audience with him. They bring Aelin's treasure to try and, you know, buy their support and they notice that there are five royals there. There's Argon, who is the Prince of Spies, and I think the oldest son. There is mm -hmm. Sartak, who is kind of the Rook Rider Prince. And then there is Hassar, the princess. Caution, a prince. Duva, who is a pregnant princess. And then there was one that we learn apparently committed suicide, the princess Tumalun. And so everything is decked out in white, which is the morning color of Antica. 
and Nezrin and Kaol are both in their feelings. Kaol really wants to be healed. Nezrin is returning home, in a sense. So the Coggin did kill his brother, but I got the sense that he didn't do it solely for the succession rights, because I very Game of Thrones-esque. I got the feeling that the brother was similar to the King of Otterland in like his exploits and stuff. And so I think that that might have been one of the reasons he got murdered, not necessarily that the Coggin wanted to be Coggin. Because they did mention a lot that they were going to let their siblings live, but they like basically sterilized. The word? sterilized. I was about to say defertilized them. <laughs> <laughs> like that's not the word. Them eggs. <laughs> <laughs> but they sterilized them. So I got the sense that a lot of times they did live. They just were sterilized so they couldn't have kids. It's so succession bizarre. problems. Yeah. Uh, that's one way to solve that problem. <laughs> which that comes up later um, when we get back to Irene. Because one of the princes is... I'm going to go on a limb and say he's in love with Irene. And she's like, no, because I really don't want to have to be sterilized and like worry about any kids that I might have and worry about my husband being killed if he does something that a brother doesn't like or sister, I guess. Prince Caution, right? That's the Mm -hmm. one that's like so into her and just constantly making eyes. I got very, like, Greek and Roman gods, like, vibes off of these six people because, like, the Coggin is, like, Zeus. And then you've got the, like, really smart girl, which is, like, Athena, right? And you got the really pretty girl, which is, like, Aphrodite. You got the one that's, like, all about war and spies and all of that. And then you've got the one that's really, really pretty, and would normally be your pick of the gods, but somehow is super unlucky in love, and that's Apollo. I agree. I'm glad that you mentioned that because I wouldn't have linked those two, but it's exactly that way. Yeah, so they're in the audience with these, you know, this great Kagan, Urus is his name, and these five children. They learn the youngest committed suicide, and then they get their trove from Aelin rejected and the king basically calls them out or the Coggin calls them out and he's like, I know that you're trying to get our aid in the war. We're not going to make a decision on that today, but you're more than welcome to hang around and, you know, try and get healed at the Torch Esme. <laughs> he also calls out the fact that he knows that that's Aelin or Selena Sardothian's money and like one through assassinery. And that is definitely a word. Probably not. But... <laughs> Um, and so he calls him out that he knows that his king, and this is the first time Kale has heard about this, was basically deposed. And Rithold is now under Parrington's control and the witch's control. And so Kale goes like on a rabbit hole of, is Dorian okay? Like, where is he? Why would he give this up? What's going on? And it's just sad to see. The audience with the court immediately plummets their their morale. And even with Nezrin, because her family was left back there. And you remember Lysandra left. No, she didn't leave her family with Nezrin's family. Did she? No, she's in Terrison. Okay. Yeah. With, what's his name? The leader of Terrison, Lord something, and Wren and Murtaugh. Murtaugh, yeah. Okay. So we have K- all upset that Dorian is not accounted for and Rifthold is no longer in the empire. And then we have Nezrin upset because she doesn't know the status of her family either. And Nezrin is very family oriented. We see throughout part one that she's excited to like reunite with her aunts and uncles and her cousins who are pretty well off as far as society goes here. Like they can afford to uh, hire bodyguards and, and that sort of thing. They have like their own little private estate that Nezrin gets to visit. But after this, you know, I think it's basically Kaol taking a hot bath after this to process. Nezrin is processing her in her own way. And then we get a scene where we see Miss Irene Towers because Irene has been making us proud the last couple of years by killing it in her studies. She passed the test with the highest score ever in the Tori Chesme history And so she is basically able to go overseas now and serve as a healer in the war if she wants to. And she does want to very, very much 
as her sense of revenge in paying back Otterlin for them killing her mother and her family. But the healer on high, Hafiza, is... She knows that Irene needs more healing internally, that she her emotional trauma still has yet to be processed. So she asks her to stay for one last kind of mentor lesson, if she will. You want to talk about it? So yes, we meet up with Irene and she has been tasked with one more healing um, that the healer on high thinks will help her as well. But before that, I want to backtrack to this bath that Kale took. Because there is a part in that that I'm just like, it shows you exactly what kind of court we are in, where it's kind of both a utopia and not at the same time. There are parts that Kale's like, I really wish our kingdom can get to this point. And then there are parts where I'm like, eh, is that goals? So this kingdom doesn't have slaves like Otterland did. It has more... You know, you pay the people, but the people that are servants in the the palace are expected to do things that normal people probably would think. So when Kale is taking his bath, the person who fixed his bath, the servant, tried to give him a happy ending. And he's like, wait, wait, hold on. Like, no. I just want the bath. Like, we don't need to do everything else. So they're expected to keep the royalty and the royal guests happy, which is just kind of creepy in my my mind. Kaja? So the servant Kaja, she did that? Like, she offered? Uh Okay, I have to go back and read that part then, because maybe it was, like, subtle and it just wasn't clicking with me when I was Well, and they, they make comments after that about she was selected to make him happy. And things, and it was heavily implied that it was in sexual ways as well. Mm -hmm. And later on, we see the scene of the party. And again, the servants are expected to keep the people happy in a sexual way. Hmm. Interesting. But they were never forced. It was all their choice. Like, but they knew that that was like an expectation if you chose to do this. Kind of a thing. Yeah. So it's good and bad because at least they weren't forced. There's still a power dynamic at play, so it's exploitative. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just a little creepy. But at mm-hmm. least KL was like, you know what? No. Like, I'm good. He's so uncomfortable. It's so funny because Mr. Yes. Ooh, I can't show my chest anywhere. There were so many scenes that it reminded me early on in the books when he was trailing with Miss Lillian in the contest and he's like running around shirtless and there's girls just showing up to watch him sweaty. And it was kind of happening with like the training sessions here. Uh (laughs) And it just, I, I forget that kale is a handsome, tall, you know, squeaky kind of guy. And it was nice to kind of get that reminder again, I guess. I think because the previous books, Besides the like first and the second one, like it built him up and then it just tore him down. And so I think you forgot why you loved him in the first place because it tore him down so much. But yes, he did gain some points from me with the like, no, I realize that this is an expectation on your part, but like, yeah, like I have honor and Nezrin was there and stuff. And so when Irene, when Irene agrees to work with Kale and she shows up late and Nezrin and Kale are just like, what the fuck? Like, why is this healer late? And then she shows up and her bedside manner is non-existent. And they're just like, what did I do wrong? And she's just very rough with him and very curt with him and not saying that she's going to work with him, just that she's assessing him in a way. And she is very begrudging of this. She doesn't want to, but the fact that she doesn't want to means that she has a lot of growth. And Hafiza knows what she's talking about with getting her to do this one last lesson before she goes. And it it was, 
I don't want to say it's overkill because it's definitely not. I think there's a lot of opportunity for Kale to continue growing, but it was definitely another humble moment for him because he sees from an outsider's perspective that this king that he served for so long damaged so many lies irrevocably. And so he is just in it and there's no escaping it in the the day-to-day of this country that they're in, Antica. And yeah. Two points with that. One with Irene, I don't think her bedside manner is bad. I think that she is holding things against KL. And so if it were anybody else, I get the sense that she has some really good bedside manner. She just hates KL. Like with a passion, she hates everybody that stood with the king and his atrocious actions and all of that. And so she is holding that squarely on his shoulders. And for KL, I think it's a it's a point where I think he thought he was doing good with inaction. So I think he thought, you know, by not going and killing people, I'm better than the people who did go and kill people. But he is now realizing that his inaction actually caused harm to a lot of people. And so I think that that is something that he is coming to terms with because I think he set himself at a different level than like the king because the king was doing the bad things and he was just kind of there allowing it to happen. So he's not that bad, right? But in reality now, he's seeing that he could have stopped a lot of bad things and he chose not to. Huge wake-up call for him. And as the days go on... Kale and Nezrin essentially are there, not just for his healing, but they, if they have to be there, they're going to try and get, you know, more information about what's going on. It comes out that I think it's Prince Caution who thinks that the younger sister was not, did not commit suicide, that she was killed. And we see a scene where Irene goes to the library to find out more about what's ailing Kale, because the more that she works with him, the more she sees that It's not something of this world that's affecting him, that's in him. It's a very supernatural kind of healing process because she essentially has to connect with him and gets access to his deepest, darkest memories, the things that are eating away at him literally on the inside. And she gets these bits and pieces of his upbringing with his dad and um, just finding out the story, you know, behind a scar on his face, which... It was sad seeing those um, those moments with a young Kale and what prompted him to leave his family and go to you know the kingdom and embrace his life serving the royal family, um, particularly Dorian. And so she's figuring out more of this, finding out that what has impacted him is not something that is a normal injury. And so she goes to the library to do more research on this kind of thing. And there was a very creepy scene where we get to see some of that training that Irene did, you know, her street smarts and common sense, which how many times as a woman have you like pretended to be on the phone or something walking somewhere by yourself? Oh, like, hey, yeah, I'll see you in just a second. And you're pretending that someone that you know is coming close by so that people stalking you will like go away. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We get to see those little moments of Irene in the library when she is being followed by a dark presence and then pretty much trips over a corpse of a girl that looks just like Irene, hollowed out husk, which we saw in Air of Fire when Aelin was over there um, with the Volg draining these bodies. And so it's spread here. And now they don't know if it's because Kale and Nezrin brought it over from the ship or if it was here already. And so now it's becoming very important for this court to figure out what's going on and get to the bottom of it too. Yeah. And this court, it has been mentioned multiple times that this is the like superpower, basically. This court was the strongest. This court was the one that could turn the tides. So it makes sense that the Vogue would be there. And Kale does share some of the information with Irene before she goes and starts researching. So she knew what Vogue were. She knew um, what they had dealt with a little bit. Um, Now, he did not share what the word keys were or the words like 
the the lock or well he doesn't know the lock but the gate the word gate so she is missing that information but in one of the books she finds it does talk about that and so she comes back to him and she's like what about these things and he's like where'd you hear that like I didn't tell you that part like I left that part out and she's like it's in this book and she showed him the book and something else was mentioned there that I wrote down because I'm like wait a minute Erewhon wasn't the only king that came over there were three kings and so she's like what happened to the other two like are you sure you're dealing with this one because it's important and kale's like there were three shit we don't know what happened to them and so i have a feeling that was a foreshadowing moment where we're gonna find out that either the two are trying to come back or maybe this isn't really erwan or something i feel like there's gonna be something with three kings yeah, i can't remember the name one started with an o and the other was like mantic mantics or something like that but it was definitely like a chills moment because kale was like oh i assumed that they were just killed or banished and irene's like but if they're banished and we're dealing with word gates then it's possible that they're being summoned to come back if they're not back already <laughs> yeah it's like logic would would side with the fact that we might still be dealing with three. Yeah. So now he's, they're just like full oh shit mode. So while they're uncovering all of this stuff, like this mystery, whether the Volg have already infiltrated the Southern continent, there's a lot of personal growth going on between Kaol and Nezrin as well. We saw in previous books that they had kind of a convenient hookup type of relationship going on since they were already working together, smuggling you know, people with magic blood out of the empire to keep them safe. And we see them start to diverge and go on different paths. So Nezrin is having all the feelings and overwhelm being in her homeland and getting in touch with her roots again. And she starts becoming very good friends with Prince Sartak, who I love. He is such a friendly, warm character and just seems so apart from the others at court. Like he's off doing his own thing. And so we see that in Antica, they have their own aerial force, if you will. And they ride these birds called the rooks, which are not as large as the witch wyverns, but they would be able to keep up and maneuver and, you know, and battle in the air and that sort of thing. And Nezrin starts taking trips with Sartak and visiting, like she goes off to visit another clan or something is where he's going to go for a couple of weeks. And so her and Kaol start splitting apart, but they're okay with it, you know? So I get the sense that she is kind of okay with it, but Kaol being Kaol <laughs> is, is in his feelings about it because there is a moment between him and Irene And he has, like, not loyalty, but loyalty out the ass, even when it's not needed. Like, to the king, he was super loyal, even though he knew the king was doing bad things, blah, blah, blah. And so he still feels loyal to Nezrin, or that he should be loyal to Nezrin. And she's like, it's okay, dude. Like, I understand. But he has feelings for Irene I think and he's hiding those and like pushing those down because he has a sense of loyalty to Nazareth doesn't he flat out tell Irene that he can't because he like made a promise or something to to Nazareth I feel like he flat out rejected Irene and Irene was just like "Uh, okay yeah a few times and then there were a few times where they got close and so Irene is like having this whiplash moment like okay like, weren't we just close? Like, why are you now treating signals. me like shit? Like, what's going on here? I feel like Kale is just feeling very inadequate. You know, he's mm-hmm. stuck in this in this chair. He was always really sure of his skills, training and being captain of the guard. And he's not used to being at the mercy of other people's help. It's hard for him to accept. We see Irene get this little invention that allows him to go horseback riding it supports him and is able to keep him upright to do that. And we see a little bit more light and joy return to him that he's able to get outside of this chair and be out there and do something like that. But with 
there's a scene where he got just humiliated getting off of it because he felt like just a dead weight falling off of a horse, essentially. And he has this audience with all these young girls that he's going to train other, you know, soldiers of the guard. And he's just embarrassed. It puts him in a bad mood. He takes it out on Irene and just is being very moody and standoffish. To his defense, I can understand that. Like, anybody with a disability, like especially if it's not one you've lived with your whole life and you've had like, like he has, you've had a life where you were at the top of your game. It's hard to all of a sudden lose that. And it's hard not to feel inadequate. I think for a lot of people, and it's hard not to like take that out on people, but to his defense with Irene, I think she's still at that point pissy with him because of the things that happened to her family under the King's rule. And so I don't think she's thinking about him as a person so much as I have to do this in order to leave. Like, he's not a full person. He doesn't have feelings in her mind. And if he does, she doesn't really care because he was responsible for this bad that was in her life, right? And so she basically does that to show the other healers what it's like to heal somebody that doesn't have their legs or whatever. And how to help them get up and down and whatever, because they don't get a lot of that at the Tori Chesme. It's always them having to go to that person. And every healer can't go to one person. And so the younger healers don't get to experience that until possibly later. So what she's trying to do is give them that sense, but she doesn't also clue in Kale that that's going to happen or take into account his feelings about it. And so in his mind, she was doing that just to humiliate him and didn't take his feelings into account. And in her mind, she's like, well, he didn't really have feelings, so it's okay. My means or my ends meet, like, make the means worth it. And Kale was the means and he's not okay with that. And so I think that they're both just in their own feelings and haven't grasp that each other's feelings are just as valid it was hard to watch there was one part in particular when irene was like yeah can you feel anything below this or what about your manhood can you does your manhood function or and he's just like what the fuck and everyone's getting kind of like giggly and you know because it's a sensitive subject but i mean she doesn't pull any punches she just does not read him at all well there and well again i think it goes back to she doesn't give a shit (laughs) she's like i don't really care how you feel like i'm here to do a job and that job is what's going to get me to do what i want to do which is to go back to my homeland and help the people there like i'm helping you just because i have to like she wouldn't have helped him otherwise yeah She would have been like, nope, you're paralyzed. Just desserts. Like, you served a king that did atrocious things. You deserve it. To make things a little more complicated, the Princess Hussar makes, forces Irene to help her spy on Kaol and Ezrin and dig up more information, which Irene doesn't want to. But the princess basically threatens her. If you don't help me, you're not allowed to go to the northern continent to help in the war. So if you want that, then you're going to do this for me type of thing. However, like I picked up on something with her that I think is going to end up helping in the end, because it was made mention that Hassar is head over heels in love with her girlfriend, Rinya. And Rinya used to be a prostitute and got out of that life because Hussar fell in love with her, right? And so we have Sartak, who is getting close to Nezrin. We have Caution, who is close to Irene. And yes, he wants more out of it. So we're going to see if he turns into one of those nice guys that's not nice if he gets turned down, you know? But he's close to Irene, who, as we know, Irene is close to Aelin already, Nezrin is close to Aelin. She has nothing but good things to say about Aelin to Sartak. Now we have Hussar, who I think because of her connection with prostitute and the fact that Aelin stood up for the prostitutes 
and Lysandra is with her and things like that. They're going to form a connection there. So we have three of the five remaining children of the Coggin that will have reasons to side with Aelin. Yes. And in, in addition to that, the comment that you made earlier about the society, like the prostitutes and servants, they can, you know, offer themselves up, that happy ending, blah, blah, blah. The fact that Hassar is with a former prostitute that had a terrible time, but it's another way that this society is so different from Otterland, so much more lax and loose. They're less judgmental of how people make a living. And so the fact is any servant, you know, given the opportunity can elevate their status by entering into relationship with someone of the royal family. So it's not something that's shunned in this society. So it just shows you another just contrast with, yeah. We kind of just skipped over a very, well, Sandra mentioned it, but there is a scene right after Kale falls off the horse um, where he is at the Tory Chesme, and he is helping with a self-defense class that Irene leads. And it is funny, and I'm not really sure how he has not caught on how Irene learned these things, because they are quintessential Selena Sardothian moves. But Irene has been teaching the young ladies of the Tory Chesme self-defense, because he, she told Selena, who she didn't know was Selena, that she would, you know, promote her self defense so that other young women could know how to to take care of themselves. And so she has been teaching, and everybody is welcome. And Kale goes, and he's helping, and he's like, "Okay, have you covered like stepping on the instep? Have you covered like?" hitting people in the groin have you covered and she had and so he's like just helping her move the classes along just a little bit and it's very funny because again it's it's miss congeniality up there on stage and all of these girls as sandra mentioned are all about kale like he's so cute and they're giggly and you know all these things and it's just, you see Kale from books one and two again, where the girls are falling all over him. He's got a little bit more confidence in himself again, because this is something that he knows and he feels good about helping them learn how to defend themselves. It's such a cute, fun scene. It was like one of the only bright scenes in this book. Yeah, it was very dark. And a lot of it was just political intrigue and what is going on with the Volg behind the scenes, because we don't really know what's going on. We just know that they are there and that Irene is at risk. They are after Irene because what they assume to be, because she is helping Kale get better, but we don't really know for sure. And so a lot of this book is just Nezrin going off on her own, doing her own thing, meeting up with her family, rekindling that relationship, and then getting to know Prince Sartak, but under the guise of, I'm getting our relations with this court improved. It's like, we see you. We see you, girl. And she's doing a little bit of spying because she's asking him questions about like, have you heard where Dorian is? Have you heard where Aelin is? And stuff like that. And I think he knows what she's after. Yeah. Because he's the, like, he's the spy king, you know, he's the spy prince. So I think he knows what she's after. And I think he's helping her w under the guise that, like, I'm just, like, flirting with you. But, like, I'm trying to help you in a way that, like, my brothers and sisters don't, and my dad, don't figure out that I'm helping you. When you see Nezrin with Kale and Nezrin with Sartak, why do you think, or do you think, that they just make a better match? I do like Sartak better. Sartak is very Dorian-esque, like fun, like easy. And I think Nezrin has enough hard in her life that an easy like person is better for her. And for the end game, I like that like she's getting more and more people to Aelin's side, even if it's just in a, a little way. I don't think we've talked about this near enough. But Nezrin is a badass in her own way. I mean, she had the arrow that they talk about that saved Aelin, essentially, in that battle that went down with the glass palace shattering. 
And so she is sharp with a bow and arrow. She can take care of herself. But it's as Tara said, I think that Sartak does offer that that lightness. And also there's just that cultural appreciation that they share. Their family, they have big, boisterous families. I'm sure that they see a lot of parallels in that. And it's a, it's a kind of comfort to find that in each other. Yes. And as Sandra mentioned her family, like she warns them at a certain point that these people are here and because of me, you might be in danger. And they're like, yeah, well, we'll hire some extra security. And they're like, what about you? And she's like, oh, don't worry about me. Like I've taken on these people. Like it's fine. Like I will be fine. And so she knows she's badass too. It's funny because she's like, oh, you don't even know everything I've done there. And then she talks to Sartak and Sartak is like, oh, I know what you've done there. I've heard, you know, the stories about you. And it's just like this moment with her where she's like very Mm -hmm. flattered and yeah, it just pulls them closer together. And what I loved was there was a tender moment between Kaol and Nezrin when they were coming to terms with them coming on divergent paths now. And he was like, well... I promise you an adventure. That's what we said when before we set sail for the Southern Continent. And she's, in a weird way, getting one now. Because I don't think it gets more adventurous than hopping on a giant bird with a prince of a foreign country and then just going off into the sunset for a couple days, you know? It was so cute when her aunt and uncle, like hinted that they thought she was going to bring the prince to like their house and she's like why would I do that and they're like oh well we heard you were on his like a bird <laughs> and she's like oh my god <laughs> uh-huh uh-huh she's like I'm with kale because this is before like the diverging paths but she's like I'm with kale and then there was the whole scene of the Coggin and the Coggin's wife are being hit hard with their youngest daughter death right especially the coggins wife and so everybody's kind of tiptoeing around the mother and he misses dinner one day and we get to see what the princes and the princesses are really like because they let their hair down and they throw a party and by party i mean it was basically an orgy like <laughs> they had like this little smoke stuff that was an aphrodisiac and they had all of their little servants come in and they're all like just sitting on couches making out and like other things and all in this one room and this is where we see kale and irene have a moment too because they go off into the corner a little bit away from some of the smoke but they're still getting a little bit of it and they have a moment and kale's like what the hell is happening because his loyalty in his mind should be to Nezrin. And then you see Caution over on the side, like giving him this death stare. And I know it was supposed to be a serious scene, but like I had a problem not laughing because the like look I envisioned on Caution's face was just hilarious because it's like very, very mad that Irene and Kale are getting close and that she's not getting close with him because he's in love with her. And yeah, it was just like, to me, very comical, um, which I know is supposed to be very serious and steamy, but. No, it was funny because you have this party. So first off, like the dinner beforehand is so outrageous because Princess Hazar is very outspoken and very, she's very much just, she's a lot. And then you have all these siblings just talking over each other. They all have like different things that they're trying to get, different information they're trying to find out, different people they're trying to catch the eye of. Then they have this after party. As Tara said, yes, there's these aphrodisiacs in the aroma that's being circulated and and opiates. And it's just, there's music and, and lounge chairs and there's you know, thin curtains everywhere. It's a very, I describe the scene as sensual and decadent and very intimate. And, and it, it's like Kale sitting across from Irene or on, on one side of her and it's like caution on the other side. And he is literally in the act of bending over to like invite her to go sit with him privately. And Kale just <laughs> jumps in there and asks first. And she's like, okay, sure. <laughs> Yes. And then you also see a little bit of the like the court intrigue between the brothers and sisters because I don't know. I thought Sartak being the oldest would be like 
you know, heir apparent. But when Nezrin was talking to Sartak, he's like, no, it's actually probably going to be Caution or Hassar, I think is who he said. And so they each think the other one is going to be the heir apparent. And I think Hassar probably thinks she is. Um, but Hassar is in a same-sex relationship. So there's the question of how is she going to have heirs? Who is she going to pull into that relationship to have heirs? And she's not letting that go because, well, if they get murdered, like she has no way of having heirs. So then the Coggins probably not going to pick her. And so there's a lot of like, you know, just trying to figure out who they need to cozy up to really who's going to be the heir apparent. And it's very intriguing because we've got three of the five. And I think the one that's pregnant now is her name Duvan or something like that. Duva. Duva. Nobody really thinks she's going to be it from what I can get gather from the book. So it's Sartak, Caution, Hussar, and then the A name. Argus. Argus, yeah. Which we don't really know a whole lot about him. No. He's just kind of the war-minded. Well, and he's very, like, spy so he's very staying mm-hmm. out of everything. But from what Sartak said, he's not going to be the one. Because I don't know that his dad trusts him. Maybe he stayed so far out of it, his dad doesn't know whether or not he can trust him. It's just an interesting family dynamic that this mm-hmm. family has. Because you see that they have strong relationships with one another in their own way, and they do seem to get along in one sense, but they also, at the back of their minds, are kind of avoiding facing this fact that at some point, they're going to have to do this and figure it out and do whether it's the sterilization and all of that. And they just keep kind of putting it off and putting it off. But... Along with this court intrigue and then Nezrin going off and doing her thing with Prince Sartak, we do see Kaol make leaps and bounds, you know, relatively speaking. Like, he can wiggle <laughs> his big toe, Tara. And he gets feeling <laughs> up to his, like, ankle. Yes. He's so, making progress, which is he is so good for him in speaking to the development that's going on with him internally, but also Irene's ability and her talent because it's kind of a shared journey for the two of them. They're going down this road together. They're learning about each other. And so it's bringing them closer together and building a trust with them. And there is a moment that you see that trust because as she's healing him, she is taking a lot, a lot of like not damage, but a lot of the burden because she has to fight the darkness that caused this to him. And so she has a lot of physical manifestations of this healing, like bleeding nose and just being tired and passing out. But she hit a point one time where she found him in the healing process and he was stuck in this like horrible, bad, like memory. And so she gave him one of her bright memories to offset that. And so he gets to see her memory as a child with her mother And it was one of those moments where you're like, okay, she's coming around to seeing that he's not this horrible person that she thought he was, that he was doing what he was doing for a reason that he thought was good. And so they have like, they form this little, I don't want to say connection, but kind of connection of understanding. Mm -hmm. And it was a very sweet memory. And then because you know that, You also see the fact that her mother is still kind of there on her shoulder. In some of the scenes, like the library, it's her mother's voice that she's hearing to tell her to run and to like stop and to think what's going on around her. And I mean, you also see that with a lead, like she has the the God on her shoulder and Lorcan has the God on his shoulder and telling them to do things. And so I'm wondering if that is Silva. another person telling her, like, mm-hmm. you know, another God coming into play here or another, like, being of some sort coming into play. There's a lot of ancient power at play, it seems. And I think they do say at one point that Antica is at least 1,500 years old, or at least the library mm-hmm. is too, which rivals Otterland's royal library 
And the fact that the cal- the castle's built on an old ruined part too, like they have mm-hmm. that in parallel as well. But with Irene and Kaol getting close, it does put her in danger. So we saw with the library scene, there was a Volg after her that she had to, you know, street smart her way out of to get out of that library alive. You've watched The Wheel of Time. So a little bit. You you remember the Aja, all the different color Aja, mm-hmm. and they all practice in this tower. Different of kind women. of yeah. Mm-hmm. This reminded me of that. The Tower of Tori Chesme, mm-hmm. where all these women healers work. Um, but they had less ego than the Aja women. <laughs> so another, like, as you point that out, so Irene's last name is Towers. And people keep mentioning, like, oh, like, is that because of this tower? And now that I'm thinking about, like, the God like thing that I just said about, like, a God on her shoulder, and you mentioned her mom. Like, mm, like her family is, is she a descendant of Silva or, you know, like, is that the reason they have the last name towers? Like, is she like Mala's, you know, like Aelin's Mala's descendant? Like, mm. Mm -hmm. I think that there's more going on. I think she is more than what we found out so far. And that, that also like goes to, I don't know that just any healer would have been able to bypass the darkness in the wound that Kale has. And so again, I, it's just Sarah J Mass like weaving this like web of intricacies that I would have just forgotten. Like, oh, I had this healer back here in this book five books ago and, you know, blah blah blah. It's just a masterful like weaving together and I think we're going to going to get more of that web. Yeah. Such a great call out. But we know because Irene and Kale are getting close. It may be because of that, that she's being targeted by the Volg now. Maybe it is, as Tara just pointed out. Maybe it is because her roots maybe are revealing something important about herself. And maybe that's the real reason why she's being targeted by the Volg. We don't know yet. Maybe we'll find out in part two. But this book felt so foundationally different from the other Mm -hmm. books because it was more internalized trauma being explored and the healing process and all of that. And then we get these scary moments. So you want to talk about the scene where it's toward the last part of the book, like what's happening with Irene? (laughs) So Irene had just left KL because KL was being a (laughs) douchebag and it was right after they had, like it was the morning after they had their moment right party Mm -hmm. yes and i want to talk about something else from the party first but so another scene that made me giggle a lot in this party is irene is supposed to be spying and giving information to hassar right and kale figures this out and he's like here's a piece of information you can give her like tell her that (laughs) that Aelin went to Skull's Bay because there's no way in hell she went to Skull's Bay. Like, the dude told her he would kill her on sight if she went to Skull's Bay. There's no way in hell. And it made me laugh so hard because that's exactly where Aelin is. And so in his mind, he's giving them the furthest away possible from where Aelin is. But in fact, he's telling them where she is. And I'm just like, oh, even in you trying to do good, Kale, you are doing horrible. <laughs> and it made me laugh so hard because he was trying. He was trying so hard. How was the guy? He was trying to, to be so smart, um, but it, it did not succeed. Um, but then, okay, so back to the scary part right after this funny part. So KL has this moment with. Irene, and he's feeling his feelings about it. He feels like he betrayed Nezrin. And so he goes back to his room, and Nezrin is gone. She's like, hey, I don't hold you to any of the promises you made me, like, and I'm not going to follow those promises either. Like, she's basically like, I'm going to sleep with Sartak. Like, this, this is this is going to happen, right? And so he's in his, like, feelings. He's like, well, even if you don't hold me, I'm holding myself, and like, I blah, 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 right? And he ends up treating Irene like horrible, like the worst he's treated her because he feels bad about this. And Irene's like, what the fuck just happened? Like, 
why? Like, what, what did I do? Like, last night we were on good terms. Like, what happened? And so she leaves and she finds out that Nezrin, like, left or whatever. And she goes back. She's going to give him a piece of her mind about him treating her like crap. And she is on her way back. She's fuming. And all of a sudden, her little ghost person over here tells her to run. And she's like, okay, like, I'm going to run, I guess. And so she is hearing somebody following her. And this person's like, you better get, like, move, move your butt. And she's hearing people behind her. And so she starts running. And she gets to Kale's room. And she slams the door. And he's like, what's, what's going on? She's like, go to your room go like wheel yourself as fast as humanly possible into your room and so she's locking the door and somebody like runs into it and bangs on it and they keep banging on it yes and and she gets into kale's room and the person like starts saying irene and kale's like what do you want and they're like irene And, and kale's like got his little knife in his in his like lap and he basically says you know like you need to run. Like, I'll stop. I'll hold them off for a little bit. Like, basically saying, I'll give up my life. Get out of here. And they end up getting out because one of the maids, like, walked by and saw the door crushed, right? And sent for Sart- or sent for the guards. And the guards come in. And when they get there, nobody's there. Like, nothing's there. The doors are just busted. Um, and Kale's like, well, I really didn't want to die. So that's good. Cause I'm not really sure how I would have gotten you out otherwise. And so she sends for caution and caution's like, are you okay? Like all in his feels about his love being attacked. And basically at that point, Kale's just like, it was the Vogue. It was a Vogue creature. Like they're here. We need to figure out what's going on and then the the part ends that scene was so scary it was high adrenaline it was tense she's by herself frantically racing through these halls trying not to look back or else she's gonna trip and fucking get killed and it almost reminded me the picture that comes to my mind is the shining here's johnny when he's like head in the door and just looks fucking crazy and every time johnny yes every time he's whispering her name and then shouting it but who do you think it is do you think it's somebody or do you think it's someone at court do you think it's someone there in the castle what do you who do you think oh who the vogue creature is i was like i think it's a vogue creature i don't know i didn't very i didn't think about that because it's hints like it happened at the tory chesme which means that to me, it would have to be somebody that was able to get into the Tori Chesme and not be noticed like an outsider, right? Yes, and the person that kept her there is the healer on high. And as we know, the Vogue likes powerful people. So the healer on high would be a good. She also has been very into what Kale's doing. Like she keeps walking away with him and talking to him and stuff. So that would be a I mean that would be a respectable guess too and but I don't also, know if she would be I mean she she did come to the palace so she would be able to get into the palace and not be noticed otherwise you know like I'm trying to think of somebody that wouldn't be like completely awkward for them to be in both places and trusted in both places there's the fact that princess Tumaloon was killed before Nesrin and Kaoli ever got there too so there's just so much mm-hmm. mystery but it's like is there somebody is it one of the princes or princess is it a servant because we see time and time again irene is very paranoid and is like don't say anything out loud let me whisper very closely in your ear or they send you know kaja or whatever out of the room yeah to have is tumaloon really dead like yeah have we seen her we body? haven't seen her body like the only person that i know of that is mentioned seeing her body is hajar i think or duva maybe one of the sisters saw her body and said she jumped. And that's the only reason we know, like, think she jumped. So maybe it's one of them. Maybe that's why Hajar or Hazar is very, like, bossy mm-hmm. and gets her way because she has that. Because as we've seen, people who have Vogue get their way. They have it's that just, air of power. Yeah. With the princes, definitely. With what was the one that took the form of, was it Fenris? The shapeshifter mm-hmm. that took well, that's that's the bloodhound. 
It was a bloodhound. Mm-hmm. Because so it, it wasn't could a be something creature. like that too. Like it could be something like that too, because it still yeah. could emulate someone and have them just be slightly mm-hmm. off somehow. But we don't know any but, of them well. But enough. we had the body that was shriveled, and that's a Volg. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's not the bloodhounds MO. So that points to a bog possession. And that like the princes were the ones who were shriveling the bodies. You remember? Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't just a vog creature that was shriveling the bodies. It was the princes. So it also lends to the fact that we might have a prince somewhere in our midst. And again, they have to have the higher powered people to like be in their bodies. I know you love a good mystery. It's like mm-hmm. what would be the what would be the goal? of murdering this young princess, you know? Yeah. We really haven't gotten a lot of time with Argon. And that might be a a thing for him being it because we haven't gotten a lot of time. Like maybe he's trying to stay back so that we don't sense that he is the Volg. Because, I mean, at least with Aelin, and Kale doesn't have any magic, but Irene does. And... Everybody that had magic could sense the Vogue in the people. And we haven't done that, or Irene hasn't done that. So it also like lends to we don't we haven't met the person or she hasn't met the person that has the Vogue inside them yet. So it could be somebody like Tumaloon that nobody's met yet from our group that she really didn't die. Yeah, that was a good call out. We didn't see her body. We saw everyone mourning for her and the parents being distraught over the loss of her, but yeah. Mm. Maybe they really didn't lose her and they know it. We will have to see in part two. I have a feeling it's hard for me to remember exactly everything that happens. There were like a few scenes that stuck out, like the library, like the party, all of that. But I can't really remember everything that happens. But you can only imagine that part two is just going to be so much coming to a head because there are things going on. This first part, and I know I sent Sandra this text, but like it seemed like it was a lot slower than the other books. Like there wasn't a whole lot of big things going on. You had a lot of like the like mind fuck action. Um, but you didn't have any like big like, oh holy hell, like five pages of out all out like hysteria. It was all just like very slow. Yeah, the slow been burn. Any big- battles or revelations, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, we have the rest of Tower of Dawn left and then we have Kingdom of Ash and that is it. And then we say goodbye to, to our characters. I have a feeling that Kingdom of Ash is going to be like a fucking race (laughs) because there is so much that needs to like be tied up that I think it's just going to be like every page is like its own story. I mean, shit, when we finally get to re- return to that story, we're going to see our girl, Aelin, you know, all masked up, boxed up, under... I hope we see Irene coming with us, because, like, again, I just like the powerhouses. Like, we got Aelin, we got Lysandra, we got Rowan, we got Adian. Like, we got some powerhouses on our team. Um, and if so... Lysandra comes there, we have, like, every, like, every... Silent Assassins, Avenue. Rolf, Ansel and her yeah. crew. Yeah, we've got the, the, the best pirate, the best wyverns, the best magic users, the best, like, only one that we know of, like, shapeshifter right now that can just literally be anything. We've got the best of the best of the fey warriors because we've got Rowan and we got Adian and we got Gavriel now. And possibly Lorcan, if he can get a, like his head out of his ass. Um, Fenris, we don't, because he had to go back with Maeve. But like we got the best of the best. We got the best pirate, the best assassins, the best warlord, basically, is what Ansel is now. And then the best healer. Yeah, could we get the healer? Could we get the rook? Like... Aerial army? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But will it matter against if there are three kings? Three Volg kings. Well, but we or, also have some gods, like that are on our side. Because we have the gods. Are they with, on our side, or well, do they want something else? I mean, they probably want something else because that's fucking god behavior. <laughs> um, but Anieth is on our side with a lead. Like so far, anyway, they've been pointing in the right direction. And Mala, 
I, I don't know. I think, I don't know if she's on our side or not, but it's her, her ancestor. And then we have Mab, who's definitely on our side, Deanna. Or no, Deanna's the one that, like, tried to, like, nuke Skulls Bay. Um, Got a little and so I don't know there. if Mala or Deanna are on our side, but they're both ancestors of Aelin. It's like the Greek god thing that you that you called out yeah. the Coggan court. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they a all have of- their own. It's It's like the freaking Trojan War, like... <laughs> They're all like picking their favorites, like Achilles and Ajax and Paris and like all of these things. And then when it comes to it, they're like, well, it, you're on your own. Typical. <laughs> yeah. They're like, we're not actually going to do any work to help you. We just wanted to like incite this violence because we, we, we were bored. That's what I feel like Greek and Roman gods were like. We will see in part two. What's going to happen here and who, if anyone, that we have joining the cause. So come back next week for part two of Tower of Dawn. And then we will leap into Kingdom of Ash, the last book of this eight book series. It has been such a journey. And then we might have some exciting announcements about the third season coming up soon in the coming weeks. So we hope you enjoyed this episode of part one of Tower of Dawn by Sarah J. Mass. Thanks for joining the Throne of Glass series read-along, and we will see you next week. Bye! Bye.